months, in just a few weeks, just, I think it's three weeks now, the weeks are in the way because my head is already there. Our International Leader Summit, Leadership Summit is going down. It's going to be amazing. We're so excited about it and I'm just grateful to God for what he's doing. Also, Good Soil, Good Soil is filling up. Good child running over people. There, I didn't know there were so many hungry entrepreneurs out there that are trying to do it on their own and are grateful to have some tutelage and some mentoring and, some, and perhaps some money. <laughs> oh, y'all don't want no money. <laughs> All you business owners that don't want no money, you can exit right out the door there. <laughs> How many of you know it takes money to do business? <laughs> Amen. How many of you are open to receive some help to your vision some provision to your vision. Jump on your feet and make some noise if you're open to a little provision. When I found out that they're giving, they're giving a great grants up to $200,000, I thought, Lord, have mercy. Can I lead and apply? God is all your life you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. God's going to answer somebody's prayer. Hey, good soul, come on, shout somebody. I'm not sure that there aren't any seats left, but if there are any seats left, you ought to get one and get to good soil. If, if you just go for good soil only, if there aren't, you can get it online. When you register for ILS streaming, you get to peek into good soil and experience all that's going on there so that you can learn the things that you need to learn and have accessible to you the opportunities. And I just open up that amazing app and it just blew my mind. I was in the app. I know y'all don't know what I'm talking about yet, but you will in a minute, uh, that they have created to continue a movement out of a moment. Sometimes we get caught up in a moment, but what we need is a movement. Anybody can schedule a moment on the calendar, but a movement doesn't have an expiration date. This is not a moment, it's a movement. I've been preaching for over a year, things are about to shift. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I anybody feel a shift coming in your life? Amen, 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 amen. Uh, Pastor Michael Phillips, would you stand give God a praise for what you're doing with good soil? Amen. We're excited. We're excited. We're supporting you. We're following you onto the battlefield to give more capital, more information, more instruction. And I'll tell you something, the capital might be exciting, but the information is empowering. If you give people capital without instruction, they just spend it. The stats say that people who hit the lottery, about 75% of them are broke in two years. Yeah, how could they be broke? They got millions and billions of dollars. To have money and not have information is to give you something that you're just going to give back. But when you get the resources and the information, then it becomes seed into soil for harvest in your life. And you don't see the seed as something you eat. You see it as something you sow. The flower fades and the grass withers, but the word of the Lord shall stand forevermore. Some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but I will remember the name of the Lord. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower where the righteous run therein and are safe. He sent his word and healed them. Job said, I esteemed his word above my necessary food. David said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. The centurion said, don't go, just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. You ain't gonna be made without the word. Are you ready to be made? <laughs> Go to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 15, verse 8 through 9, and there you will find what the Holy Spirit has commissioned for me to share with you today. The rabbi is teaching 
in the 15th chapter, verse 8, we have caught him in the middle of his class. He is teaching through the medium of parabolic truth to, prof to, to articulate the profundity of his theology regarding the kingdom of God and what he is able to do for the people of God through stories and similes through which we can gather principles rather than to archive the artifacts of the story itself. We must be prepared to draw the principles from the story which are timeless, irregardless to culture, age, or identity. The, we find these truths to be self-evident. Beginning at the eighth verse, we are picking apart the Oreo because this is compressed between two other accommodating stories. But the, the uniqueness of this text in two verses, we will conclude a principle for which we will articulate truth for the next few moments. Let the church say amen. amen. Either what woman having 10 pieces of silver, how many Lord? 10, <laughs> 10 pieces of silver. If she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house. What does she do? Sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it. <laughs> and when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice with me. For I have found the peace which I have lost. Somebody shout, keep sweeping. Keep sweeping. Keep sweeping. The Holy Ghost said, keep sweeping. Keep sweeping. Type it on the line, keep sweeping. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us as we open up the word of God. Thank you for what you're going to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Someone shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Yes. The text by virtue of implication suggests the power of God to be restorative. That he restores that which is lost. That it is not God's will for that which is given to be taken, but if by chance it wanders or falls away, that the same God who gave it is able to restore it. Back to you. Further, it goes on to dictate to us that we are collaborative in the restoration process. That God will not restore it while we are apathetical about it, but we too have to be diligent in order to collaboratively experience the power of God to the intent that everything that fell will be recaptured. <laughs> everything that drifted away will be reclaimed. <laughs> Every sheep that wandered from the hundred and left you with a deficit will be reclaimed. But you have to be aggressive enough to go after what was lost. It wandered away, but it won't wander back. You have to go get it and bring it back into the fold in order for the restoration to be realized. God will use your feet to do the walking, your eyes to do the finding, your hands to do the untangling, but everything that got away is coming back. He uses an animal to teach this truth. He uses a lost sheep to teach this truth. 
he uses a lost son to preach this truth, the son we call the prodigal son, to illustrate that even though someone has maligned us, mistreated us, desecrated the relationship with us, that we must not allow our emotions to shut the door on the possibility that they could come to themselves. And if they come to themselves, they must not find us ignorant <laughs> to the character of God is to be forgiving and restorative. Some of us, the prodigal son can't come home because the door is closed. So the fluidity of thought and nimbleness of mind suggests that we must be open even when we're hurt. It is painful to hear the prodigal son say to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. Not because it's not his, but it says, I can't wait for you to die. Give it to me now. Anytime you want my stuff more than you want me, it's a painful reality to recognize that people have used the relationship in a spirit of manipulation rather than relation so that they could have engrandizement and entitlement to that which was laid in store prematurely. Reminds us furthermore that a blessing out of season is a curse. <laughs> Type it on the line, tweet it out to people. A blessing out of season is a curse. If it was laid up for me and I get it too soon, I won't know how to handle it and I'm going to lose it. So Lord, don't give me anything before it's season. That's what part of the blessing is on tithing, that you will not yield your fruit before it's season, that your figs will not be harvested before they are ready. There are some things that God is preparing for you in the wait that you need to be strong enough in the wait to wait on the fulfillment and the realization of everything that God has for you. It's yours, but it's not time. For there is a time and a season for every purpose under heaven. The tendency today is to want things early. Shortcuts to success. Shortcuts to benefits. Getting what you have not earned will cause you to lose it. But we're not talking about the lost lamb or the lost son today. Rather still, we're talking about the lost coin. We must recognize the fact that this is the first moment that the rabbi has allowed a woman to stand center stage in the text. She is not a son or a brother or a father or a sheep or a shepherd. She is a woman. Somebody say a woman. And the rabbi now uses a woman to express a principle that we must come to understand. Before we get too deep into the principles, I want to deal with, let me just be transparent and tell you that this message did not start with the text, as mine often do start with the text. This message started with a vision and in the spirit, I saw a coin, it looked like a dime, falling in slow motion. And the vision of the coin falling in slow motion was succeeded by a baby falling with its arms out. And then I saw masses of crowds falling. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? And the falling of the coin drove me to the text. For this woman's coin has fallen. The falling of the baby drove me to Mephibosheth. The powerful thing about the coin speaks to value. The falling of the baby to emotions and terror. 
because the baby looks petrified falling, arms flailing in the air, eyes bucked, falling down backwards. And then God settled me into the word where he began to talk about aggregate values. To, to, to aggregate is, is to cause a wholly formed thing to be combined by typically disparate elements. So the aggregate, for example, <clears throat> let me make it plain. I'm, I'm wearing wireframe glasses, so there's wire, there's glass, and there's technology that developed my prescription. And so the glasses are the aggregate of three different elements that didn't necessarily have to collaborate, but they are aggregated so I can see. The power of aggregation is important because it is the assembling of that which is unique. So when we start talking about aggregation, we are talk talking about the power of the collective and not just the individual. A lot has been said about the individual, but little has been said about the collective. And any time you focus solely on the power of the individual item, thing, steel, glass, or technology, and don't aggregate it, it does not become usable. So isolation of a valuable thing is a desecration of its collective aggregate strength. So as we think about this text, we must think about aggregate value, the collective value. I could praise him in my house. I could praise him in my car. I could praise him in my shower by myself and it would be praise. But when the aggregate composite of all of us come together, even though we came from different houses and different neighborhoods and speak different languages and have different cultures and have different political views or whatever it is that causes our uniqueness. I am not out to destroy your uniqueness at the expense of having our unity. You can still be a unique individual and be aggregated the steel didn't become glass, the glass didn't become steel, the prescription didn't become the glass, the glass, the steel didn't become the prescription. They are still unique unto itself, but the beauty of the aggregate is celebrating the uniqueness of the individual, but benefiting from the aggregation of that which is dissimilar, and yet they are brought together for unity. So I see, I see collective value in the text. Let me go deeper. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 7 through 10, and you'll begin to understand a little bit deeper. Then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. Come on. There is one alone. There is one alone. And there is not a second. There is one alone. And there, if you're there by yourself, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor. Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I labor and bereave my soul of good? This is all vanity, meaning emptiness. Yea, it is a sword travail to be alone. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. This is talking about the road to increase. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone. For when he, when he falleth, he have not another to help him up. The woe is not on the falling, it's on the aloneness. So when we teach people how to have individual power without suggesting to them that you can't get there by yourself, then we set them up to fall alone 
and the danger of falling alone is crippling your dream. In short, what's next is going to take more than you. Let me say it another way. You've gone as far as you can go by yourself. You're going to have to be open to aggregation and collaboration in order to experience celebration. For what God is going to do in the next dimension has collective value, not individual uniqueness without collective value. Your individual uniqueness has caused you to be autonomous, isolated, a unicorn, a one of a kind. I'm not trying to destroy it, but I'm trying to put it in context that two are better than one. Nobody goes to the mall to buy a shoe. Nobody goes to the grocery store to get eggshells. <laughs> it, is, it is the aggregation of the egg, the yolk, and, and, and the white that causes us to go to the store. It is not any one of them in isolation, but the aggregation of all of them that creates the nourishment that we need for survival. No avalanche occurs from one snowflake. But when all the flakes come together, that which was powerless by itself has exponential empowerment because its aggregate power can cause an avalanche to stop an 18-wheeler. One can chase a thousand. But if you can get some help and just get two, I'll give you exponential impact just through your partnership. When you aggregate with other people, I'll release dimensions of power that you couldn't have. So it seems like if one could chase a thousand, two ought to chase two thousand. No, that's not how it is. This is exponential increase. You're doing math. I'm doing algebra. God says one can chase a thousand. Two can chase ten thousand. I'll give you I increase your value through your association. Your, your, your cumulative sum total of strength is predicated on your ability to aggregate. So if I were Satan and I couldn't stop you from being powerful as an individual, I would diminish your ability to discover collective value. Everything here is about collective value. The prodigal son receives his money in isolation and spends it all, not understanding that the money was not the value. The relationship was the value. The collective strength of being in his father's house released a blessing that his inheritance did not give him. He spent his inheritance and then came to value the relationship and said, how many servants, they're not even related to daddy, but how many servants in my father's house have, have bread enough in the spirit and I perish with hunger. I'm through trying to be an individual wonder. I'm going back home so that I can discover the collective aggregate power of what I can be. Just make me a, I'd rather be a servant in the house than to be a son in a hog pen. Oh, what makes the shepherd leave the 99 and go after the one? It's because the minus one stops the hundredfold. So even though the one is alive and the 99 is alive, as long as they are separated, he can never go to the market with a hundredfold. So that little thing that you lost, you, 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 you have to be intentional about getting it back because it has collective value. It's, it's not as though you don't have something left after what you lost, but the diminishment of the collective value of what you lost is going to cause you to be aggressive about getting it back. Touch your neighbor and say, find my broom.
Sociologists tell us that people who live alone don't live long. Not as long as they could live if they had company. A person in the house, even if it's a person who gets on your nerves. Aggregated strength causes you to have collective value. If a burglar breaks in, he's less likely to break in a house if there's somebody in the house with you. It could be a kid in the house. It could be a kid and a woman, but two are better than one because if one falleth, uh, he have not another to help him. Uh, you might be a 10-year-old, but at least I can holler down 911 while I get this ax and go down these steps. You got to have somebody to be in partnership with in order to fight the good fight of faith. That's why Paul tells Timothy, I have. I fought a good fight, but he never said I fought it by myself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We're talking about exponential components of aggregation. You're praying about a million dollars and you don't understand all a million dollars is, is a collection of dimes. Somebody say million. Some of y'all, you don't even talk that talk. You don't even talk that. That don't come up in your house. Your children don't even know how to spell it. They have never heard mama say that word before. So say it again, say million. Get your lips, your teeth, your tongue used to saying it because you can't receive it if you can't say it. Somebody say million. <laughs> oh my God, when you speak stuff like that into the atmosphere, you don't know it, but you're calling stuff to you that you haven't seen yet. Somebody say million. <laughs> You can't ask for it till you speak it. You can't negotiate it till you speak it. You got to get used to your lips saying it so it don't sound strange, so you don't trip over it when you say it. Somebody shout it again, million. Yeah. Type it on the line, shout million. Yeah. Put it in your heart, shout million. Yeah. Oh. Can I go deeper with this? All you asked him for was a collection of dimes. The highest thing God can give me is a dime. A hundred dollars just tells me how many dimes I have. Because a dime is 10. And there is no number bigger than 10. That's why when I count all the way up to 10, I got to go back to one again and say 11. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Oops, I got to go back to one again. Twenty is just ten twice. Twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, or thirty. Oh, that's just ten three times. It's a collection of dimes. It's a collection of dimes. Stop sweating it. Stop getting frantic about it. Stop being upset about it. Dimes are what you're asking for. So stop throwing away your dimes because the aggregation of the dimes is what the millions are made out of. If you don't appreciate the dime, you can't handle the million because all a million is, is a collection of dimes. Let me put it in Bible language. If you're faithful over a few things, come on, come on, I'll make you rule over many. Hallelujah. High five somebody. Tell them it's a collection of dimes. I'm coming into a collection of dimes. I'm coming into a collection of dimes. I'm coming into a collection of dimes. I'm getting ready to aggregate these dimes. That's why the Bible said, despise not the day of small beginnings because everything big was made out of something small. I'm coming into a collection of dimes. All my body is is a collection of cells. 
if something happens to me on a cellular level, then something has happened to me on a physical level because all my body is, is an aggregate of cells. You've been walking over the dimes, praying for the millions, not recognizing that all a million is. If snowflakes cause avalanches and raindrops create floods, if tidal waves are made of droplets, then you might be walking over something that is going to bring you into an aggregate place of great strength because you are looking for the sum without what makes the sum total. Come on with me. The reason that we have tithes, because tithe is a word that means 10. So God says, give me 10. Because if you've given me 10, you've given me everything. Y'all don't hear me yet. 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 If you've given me 10, you've given me everything. Uh, you, 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 when, when, when you take first fruits, the first fruits, if the first fruits get blessed, then everything left is blessed. If a cook is making a pot of soup, all they need is a teaspoon. Because if there's garlic in the teaspoon, there's garlic in the soup. If it's not done in the teaspoon, it's not done in the pot. The tithe represents the whole. That's why when the ten lepers walked away, ten of them are walking away and the tenth one turns around and comes back to God now the nine got healed but the tenth one was made oh y'all don't hear what I'm saying to you, 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 you I know you've been healed by yourself but in order to be whole you gotta aggregate from other places who am I preaching to make some noise in this place there were ten lepers there were 10 coins. There were 10 virgins. What is this obsession that God has with 10? Bring me a 10. A collection of dimes. A collection of dimes is everything. God is obsessed with 10. Because if I bless the 10, I bless the whole. If I taste the soup and there's no salt in the spoon, there's no salt in the soup. When you lift up the tithe and say, Lord, I've given you the tithe, you're saying, God, all of the 90 is blessed through the representation of the tithe because 10 brings you into wholeness. You can go no higher than 10. God says, you've robbed me. You've robbed me in dimes. You have robbed me in dimes. Now to my text, two scriptures. <laughs> Merely two scriptures, three characters in two scriptures. There are three characters in two scriptures. There's the woman, notice, she is a woman, she is built to receive. <laughs> 10 of y'all got it, the rest of you didn't get it. <laughs> she is built to receive. Her gender postures itself from a place of reception she has to be a woman because she is built to receive. 
Somebody say, I'm built to receive. Now, if you only hear this naturally and don't hear the spiritual implications, then you will think that that exempted the men because I, but I'm not really so much talking about her gender. I'm talking about her position. She is built to receive. Have I positioned myself to be receptive to what God is about to do? It's not just a question for a woman. It's a question for anybody in the room. There is a posture that puts you in a position of reception. Are you open to what God is about to do next in your life? Are you open to it. Are you, I, I want an answer. Are you open? Because you can't receive it if you're not open to it. You can't receive not a dime of it, not a thing of it, not a relationship of it, not a sheep of it, not a son of it. If you're not open to it, if the door is closed, the prodigal son can't come home. If you don't seek for the sheep, you can't get it back. You got to be open to receive. So if I was the devil, I would close up your receptors so that you wouldn't be open to receive and you would settle to be valuable in isolation rather than to discover the aggregate value of the 10. Yes, sir. Can I go deeper? Are you with me, church? I need to feel you, are you with me? There are three characters in the story. There are two scriptures in the text. There is the woman, the broom, and the coins. And that's all we have to work with. It's the woman, the broom, and the coins, that's all we have. The coins, the number 10 identifies the coins, but it's only one woman, which is a 10th of the 10. You missed it. There are 10 coins. There's only one woman in the whole story. She doesn't invite people till the story's over. She is a 10th. She is what she lost. So maybe, maybe there aren't three characters. Maybe the woman and the coin have a lot in common. Because the coin is a tenth of the ten, and it's just like the woman who is one, which brings us down to understanding individual value is critical. Because if you don't understand individual value, you won't sweep. This is where the enemy comes in after your self-esteem and how you see yourself. This is where the enemy tries to erase, I can do all things <laughs> out of your head because you think you are stuck waiting on somebody else to come, but on an individual level, you have to do your own sweeping. <laughs> I can love you, but I can't sweep for you. I can pray for you, but I can't sweep for you. I can advise you, but I can't sweep for you. I can counsel you, but I can't sweep for you. You can't wait till you get married to start sweeping. Having a man won't make you sweep. Finding your woman won't make you sweep. If they wasn't sweeping when you met them, you coming along to a dead beat ain't gonna make a dead beat come alive. You got to get your broom before you get with me, baby. I need to see something something in your hand, some kind of motion, some kind of action, somebody who gets what I'm saying, make some noise in here. I can't be locked up with somebody that don't have no broom. I touch 10 people say, where's your broom? Where's your broom? Where's your broom? Where's your broom? You came to church this morning. Where's your broom? What you gonna get it with? What you gonna pull it in with? What you gonna tweet with? What's your strategy? What are you working with? Don't come to the well and not have something to draw with. Where's your broom? So the woman See, 
I, I want to I I draw a little bit more association between the woman and the coin because you, you can only gather what you relate to. She's not trying to get the nine. She got the nine. She's after the one. She is one. You can only get what you are. That's why imitating me won't make you better. There has to be an association between what you are after and what you are. So you got one woman looking for one coin to make it an aggregate of 10. Because nine is a deficit. So the decision has to be made. Are you going to live with a deficit or are you going to sweep for an aggregate? Can I, come on, come on, come on with me, church. Come on. Look at your neighbor and say, we got some sweeping to do. If you ain't a sweeper, get up and move. We got some sweeping to do. We got some sweeping to do this morning. We got some sweeping to do this morning. If we don't do some sweeping, we're not going to get the breakthrough. God's got something for us to receive this morning, but we got to be ready to do some sweeping. Are there any sweepers in the house? Make some noise. Sweepers 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 make some noise. You can't be a sweeper if you're not intentional. When you see the woman grab her broom, that means I am not going to settle to live the rest of my life in a deficit. When you see her go for her broom, it means I'm going to get back what the enemy stole from me. When you see her go for the broom, it's a sign that whatever is missing in my life, I'm willing to sweep for it. I'm not willing to do without it. I'm not willing to make the best of a bad situation. Whatever it takes to get the breakthrough that I need, I'm willing to sweep for it. I feel a sweeping spirit about to hit this house. I feel a breakthrough getting ready to hit this room. I feel a deliverance about to come. Somebody's watching over the internet and the Holy Ghost just showed you you got to get your broom back. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, you survived it. But until you get your broom back, you're not going to stop things from falling. You got some sweeping to do. But if you sweep for it, everything that the enemy took out of your life, God is going to give it back to you. Press down, shaking together, and running over whoever I'm preaching to in this room. Whatever God is talking to you about, if you are tracking with me, give God some praise in this. <laughs> so how did I saw a coin falling. I saw a coin. I saw a coin falling. I won't even begin to go into everything he showed me about it, but I saw, I saw a coin falling. And the, call, the coin fell without feeling. And then I saw a baby falling. And when I saw the baby falling, I saw Mephibosheth. He came, Shata. I saw Mephibosheth falling. Mephibosheth fell because somebody <laughs> dropped him. It wasn't even his fault. Somebody responsible, and I saw the terror of falling. I, I saw the loss of control in the fall. I saw the loss of support in the fall. And he fell. And he fell into Lodabar. Like you fell into depression. Like you fell into obscurity. 
like you fell into silence, like you fell into shame, like you fell into heartache, like you fell into narcissism, like you fell into agony. The real problem is not your fault. Somebody... They, they set a course on trajectory of fright and hysteria because you have the feeling of being out of control. And anytime you feel out of control, it triggers you. Your trigger is instigated by the loss of control because you have been dropped and etched into your memory bank is the feeling of being out of control. So you can only operate in controlled environments because when you don't feel like you're in control, you become hysterical because it triggers the trauma because somebody dropped you. So Mephibosheth fell into Lodabar and he could not get himself out. So David had to sweep for him. Come on. Come on, stay with me. So David's question, is there any left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness to? Said to Ziba, go sweep for him. Find him, he's down there in Lodabar and Ziba swept him out. The Holy Ghost said, God's gonna sweep you out. Some of you have been dropped, but God's getting ready to sweep you out. Some of you have fallen, but God's getting ready to sweep you out. Some of you have been let down, but God's getting ready to sweep you out. Some of you are just flailing through life, but God is getting ready to sweep you out. Some of you have fallen into all kinds of addictions and problems and pain and turmoil and you said, how did I get here? You got here because somebody dropped you but you're going to get out because somebody's going to sweep you. <laughs> Slap somebody and say, get ready for a comeback. Get ready for a comeback. Get ready for a comeback. Uh, you fell into something and you can't get out of it. Uh, but get ready for a comeback. Uh, you fell into a relationship, but get ready for a comeback. You fell into an addiction, but get ready for a comeback. You fell into an attitude, but get ready for a comeback. You fell into a mood swing, but get ready for a comeback. You fell into despair, but get ready for a comeback. What did you come to church for anyway? Why come to church if you're not willing to change? If you're not willing to transform? If you're not not willing to move if you're not willing to go to the next level somebody in here was lost and about to be found somebody in here God is getting ready to put you back in the position that you fell out of give him 30 seconds of crazy ridiculous Holy Ghost hysterical revolutionary restorative pray that ain't it I said restore it to pray. spoke to me just now on my feet and told me to tell you stop praying about the situation. The reason God didn't change in the situation is that God is going to raise you out of the situation. You didn't fall in it to change in it. You fell in it to be swept out of it. God is not going to change the situation because you're getting ready to move. Nudge your neighbor and say I'm getting ready to move. It don't matter what you do with it. It don't matter that you don't like me. It don't matter that you don't appreciate me. It don't matter that you don't affirm me because I'm getting ready to move. God's got his broom out and he's getting ready to sweep me into houses I didn't build, vineyards I didn't grow, doors that I couldn't open, mountains that I couldn't move. I feel a sweeping wind. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a mighty rushing wind and God swept. Let me run through the woods and climb through the creek and wrap this up. 
Mephibosheth fell as an individual. In Revelations, the church at Ephesus fell as a collective. The Bible says to the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelations, remember from what great height you have fallen. Entire movements are falling. And remember from what great height you have fallen has always reminded me of erosion. Because if I fell like Mephibosheth, I can't forget it. But if I fall gradually, I can't remember it. If I fall suddenly, it's a trigger. But if I fall gradually, I can't even notice it. So God says, remember from what great height you have fallen. That's the gradual erosion of your position, your status, or your integrity. And you don't even know when you dropped it. It wasn't a conscious decision to drop it. It was a gradual erosion. Little by little, you shrunk. Lord, your standards. Lord, your integrity. Little by little, you gave up you to fit in with them. And now you're down here in this low place, set that cold. And God says, remember from what great height you were there and look at you now. You used to be excited to come to church. Now it's a choice and it's an option. You used to be the first one waiting on them to open. When they gonna open the door? Don't make no sense, why don't they open up the door? You was fussing trying to get in. Now we can't get you out of bed and you don't even notice what day it happened. The gradual erosion of the collective is perhaps more traumatic than the sudden dropping of the individual because the sudden dropping of the individual brought awareness. Gradual erosions happen without notice. Remember from what great height you have fallen. Can I go this deep on Sunday morning? Can I, do I have permission to go this deep? Humanity fell in the book of Genesis. When Eve was a partaker of the fruit, humanity didn't fall. But when she, she, oh, it's one woman again. When she turned and gave it to her husband, all humanity fell when he bit. And everything in him fell. So everything that was born out of their union was born fallen. So we don't have to do anything wrong to be a sinner because to be a sinner is not just an action, it's a state. <laughs> it's a position. I was born in the position. I was born in iniquity. I was shaping in iniquity. I was born in sin. I was shaping in iniquity. I was if I was born in sin, before I got to do anything, I was in it before I did it. That's why I did it, because I was in it. Yeah. You, you, yeah. I, you, 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 you can't help but do it, because you was born in it. Like the woman can't help but sweep for the coin, because anytime you sweep for it, you have to be it to get it back. Kinsman, you got to be kin to what you're after. You got to be kin to what you're after. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You got to be kin to what you're after. Can I go deeper? Yeah. Jesus said, I saw Lucifer falling from heaven. I saw him falling from heaven. Final point I'm through. It's not even a point. It's a prophecy. There shall be a great sweeping. There shall be a great sweeping. But in order to get the great sweeping, you have to be intentional. You don't sweep by accident. 
the woman had an intentionality and an urgency in her sweep. She is not distracted. She is not divided. She's not cooking and sweeping. She's not looking out the window and sweeping. She has put a high priority on the aggregate value of getting back to the 10. In order to get what you're after, you're going to have to focus on it. You're going to have to shut out your ears to all outside noise and everything that everybody's been saying to you to distract you. That is not your battle. That is not your problem. That is not your assignment. That is not your business. That is not your situation. That is not your circumstance. That is not your problem to solve. Quit letting everybody drop their problems on you and let their problems become your assignment. In order for you to get the great sweeping, you're going to have to focus. Who am I talking to? I feel like a prophetic word is coming to somebody. There shall be a great sweeping. Touch three people and say, get ready to sweep for it. Watch this. Watch this. Whoever I'm preaching to. I'm talking to you. You, you, you getting this? You, you're, you're, you're ready to receive this? You're open to receive this? Are you open to receive this? If you're watching online, are you open to receive this? If you're streaming on the broadcast, are you open to receive this? This is the word of the Lord to you. Thus saith the Lord, you have lost place. You have lost place means you have lost position. You are flying at a lower altitude than what I created you to function on. You have lost place. Descending in an altitude has put you in a different atmosphere you have lost place. Hear ye the word of the Lord. You have entered into a turbulence that you're not designed to fly in because you're flying too low. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Why do I need strength? Because I'm going to mount up on wings like eagles. What do eagles do? They don't ride through the storm. They ride above the storm. If you're in turbulence, if you're in confusion, if you're in chaos, you're riding too low. It's time to lift your wings and strengthen yourself and get back at the altitude that I created you to fly in. You have lost place. You have lost time. Every day you're lost. The nine are functioning at a deficit. This woman is urgently sweeping. There's a time factor to it. You don't have time to keep making the same mistakes over and over again. You don't have time to repeat the same cycle over and over again. What used to throw me, don't throw me like it used to throw me. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't have time. I'm on a mission. If it ain't sweeping, I ain't talking. If it ain't sweeping, I'm not looking. If it's not sweeping, I'm not paying it no attention. I don't have time to look out the window. I don't have time to play games. This is my last chance to sweep. Slap somebody and say, sweep that thing. Sweep the whole house. Sweep the living room. Sweep behind the couch. Sweep behind the chair. Sweep up under the dining room table. God said you're about to get everything you lost. Give him a praise somebody. You lost place. You lost time, you lost environment, because God did not create you to be in the hog pen. 
God did not create you to be lost in the house. God did not create you to go to hell from church. What is a dime going on the floor? How did the dime get on the floor in the first place? Somebody must have dropped it for it to get on the floor. Nobody makes dimes for floors, but it's fallen into an environment that's beneath them. You have dumbed down who you are so you could have company, but God is getting ready to sweep you out. He's going to sweep you out of that clique. He's going to sweep you out of that club. He's going to sweep you out of that association. Who am I preaching to? So I'll start with this. The Lord said you've lost time. You've lost place. You've lost environment. Watch this. But you have not lost value. You, you've lost time, you've lost place, you're in a strange, lost environment, you're in Lodabar, you, you don't belong in Lodabar, you belong in the king's house, you're a king's kid, you're living beneath your privilege, but you have not, wait, wait, you've lost time, you've lost place, you've lost environment, you have not lost value. The dime is worth as much on the floor. If I was silver in the hand, I'm silver on the floor. If I was gold on this level, I'm still gold on the floor. That's why I stick out on the floor. That's why I don't fit in on the floor. That's why I don't look right with dust and dirt on the floor because I was not designed for what I'm in. Uh, whoever I'm preaching to, you were not designed for what you're in. That's why God is getting ready to sweep you out. Watch this. But the first thing you have to know is that everything that you've been through that brought you down, whether somebody dropped you or lost you or forgot you, or forsook you, what they could not do is diminish your value. <laughs> I got more message than I got time. So let me, let me wrap this up. The woman wouldn't be sweeping if she didn't recognize the value of the dime, of the tenth. It wasn't really a dime. I'm just using a dime because dime is something you can relate to. She, 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 she knows its value or she wouldn't sweep for it. If Jesus didn't know your value, he wouldn't have died for you. You might have fell into drugs. You might have fell into violence. You might have fell into abuse. But you're still valuable. And that's why he's sweeping. He's sweeping for you. They might have took your dignity. They might have hurt your pride. They may have hurt your feelings, but they have not hurt your value. You are worth just as much on the floor as you are with the nine. Watch this. But God is getting ready to sweep you back into your rightful place. Hear the word of the Lord. It's going to be fast. It's going to be sudden. It's going to be strange now. Because you've been in Lodabar so long that it looks familiar to you. So when I get you back in your rightful place, you're not going to have the language for the place you're in. I'm going to put you in a palace and you're going to say I'm a dog. 
and it's going to be a while for, it's going to be a while before you get up off the floor because when Mephibosheth, when Mephibosheth came into the house of the king he fell on the floor because he'd been down so long that whenever God raises you up you have a tendency to lay down because you can't accept up because you've gotten used to being down but God is getting ready to sweep you into a place that when you first get there you're going to say I'm a dog because you've been living like a dog but the devil is a lie you're not a dog you're a king's kid and God's got a table for you and a seat for you and he's going to get you up off of your knees he's going to get you up off of the floor and he's going to set you at a table and prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies and anoint your head with oil spin around in a circle you're going into a spin you're going into a sweep you're going into a tailspin you're going out of your element you're going away from the familiar God is getting ready to sweep you open your mouth and holler word is for the saints of God. Every saint of God who's lost something, a child, a relationship, a situation that's been grieving your heart and the enemy said give up but the devil is a lie. The Holy Ghost told me to tell you don't be weary in well doing. You shall reap in due season if you faint not touch 10 people and say keep sweeping. I mean 10 people. Keep sweeping. Keep sweeping. A breakthrough is about to come your way. A breakthrough is about to happen with your child. A breakthrough is about to happen in your spirit. Somebody give him a praise when you get to the 10th one. Give God a crazy praise. 